All right, go for it. Okay, well, hi, hi, everybody. Welcome to Ask Dr. B Live. Um, we're here today to uh, talk with you about uh, plantar fasciitis, a, a very nasty and um, challenging, painful heel condition. Um, today, it's uh, myself and Yusuf. I'm very grateful to have Yusuf here to uh, keep control of the chat line. Um, Eric is uh, a, heading up to the Great White North to escape the heat in, in his little office there. He's been cooking for the week and um, very excited with the release of uh, ROM Coach app, uh, which we're going to talk about a little later. Um, but today the format will basically be uh, similar to what we uh, always do. Um, I'm going to share a presentation. Uh, sorry, just having a little... Um, I have to go to my system preferences here, excuse me, uh, to share my screen. And what we're going to do is uh, have our presentation. And then um, we will be open for questions. Okay, let's see if I've got this going. Share screen, yes. So I'm looking forward to um, any questions that you may be, um, uh, that you may have, please uh, put them in the chat and Yusuf will uh, read them out for us. Um, today, what we're gonna do is review uh, plantar fasciitis, discuss the normal anatomy, uh, the pathology, what happens to uh, the plantar fascia so that it becomes painful, what the various treatment options are for plantar fascia, uh, fasciitis, and then how do we stop this uh, painful condition from recurring and coming back? Because that's something that we see very commonly. Uh, but before we get going specifically on plantar fasciitis, I wanted to just remind you of my view of what fascia actually is. Um, 30 years or more ago when I first started medical school, we, um, we had to take an anatomy course in first year and we would go down to the dissection lab and we actually had to um, dissect all of the internal organs and the muscles. And as part of this, uh, we would remove fascia to expose the muscles, the bones and the internal organs. And at that time, the body was viewed as 206 bones, which we layered the muscles on top of and we plugged the internal organs into the various cavities, the chest, the skull, the uh, abdomen, and then we covered it all up in skin. And that was the human body. But as I got working and particularly in surgery, and I saw the connections more intimately with um, how the tendons, the, the joints, the capsules uh, all blended together um, and, and how I uh, realized that the body remodeled and, and how forces affected the tissues, um, I started to look at the musculoskeletal system as a fascial network. And when you think about how the body develops right from the embryonic phase, the um, embryo is made of three germ layers and the one germ layer, layer called mesoderm that creates all of our bones, joints, and our muscles um, actually makes the shape of the body. So we have the shape of the body from, that is created from mesoderm, and then the internal organs come from endo and ectoderm, and they grow inside this mesodermal um, network. So every single cell in our body is really connected from the tip of the toes to the tip of the nose uh, and surrounded by fascia. And the fascia serves several functions. Um, it can be thick and broad, like the plantar fascia, or it can be more um, delicate, but basically it's a communicator. And um, it's communicating where our body is positioned in space. It's communicating how much tension and force is going through the tissues. So um, the plantar fascia is one of these broad based, uh, um, structures. And here we see on the bottom of the foot, this is the big toe. This is the baby toe. And then this is the heel. And you can see how it forms a triangle. And this is the plantar fascia. You can see the insertion that is on the heel or the calcaneal calcaneus. 
and how the fascia then fans out to each of the toes. So it's a very stiff, thick collagenous structure that is meant to bear force. I put this picture on because I want you to see all of the little tiny muscles that are in the foot. There's 20, I think there's 20, over 20 little muscles that are in the foot. And they are very important in working with the static um, physical structure of the plantar fascia uh, by dynamically supporting our foot and our arch. So if we look at the plantar fascia from the side, you can see here, this is the heel bone or the calcaneus, and then these are our toes. The plantar fascia is this thick, uh, strong structure that uh, many uh, um, uh, equate to being like the bowstring uh, of a bow and arrow. So the arch of our foot is like the bow, and then the string is the fascia. And the string actually does provide the spring in our step. So what happens uh, to cause the plantar fascia to break down? Uh, most commonly and by far the most common reason that the plantar fascia you know, becomes injured is due to repetitive wear and tear. So it is a degenerative type of problem where there's too much pressure, there's too much tension along the fascial structure. So that's the, the fascia itself. But then that fascia may continue also up the back of the body to involve the calf muscles and um, even up the, up the leg. So if you have tension along that rope, um, it ends up um, where there's too much tension and it becomes tight, then the plantar fascia can break down and tear. And it tends to tear right at the insertion. So this is looking at the plantar fascia, the foot's pointing the other way this time, but we have the heel, we have the toes, here's the plantar fascia, and there is a, a very specific spot that the plantar fascia um, breaks down and that's right at the insertion. And as usual with all of our wear and tear um, pathologies, there's a spectrum of wear and tear that goes from sort of an internal change in the micro uh, structure of the collagen and the proteoglycans that form the fascia to partial thickness tearing where you have injury and repair uh, going on. Uh, all the way to a full thickness tear. Now, full thickness tearing of the plantar fascia is actually quite rare. Um, it can happen. You can imagine if you have a significant tear and that rope in the previous picture, if you pulled on it too hard, how it could snap. Um, although it's extremely painful in many ways, you've actually treated yourself because you've lengthened now the plantar fascia and it will heal. It's not gonna be something that you need to have surgery for. Um, and it's not fun and I don't recommend going and trying to land on your plantar fascia and tearing it completely. Um, but most commonly, it's a partial uh, thickness tear of the insertion of the uh, fascial structure. And um, the reason that it becomes overloaded is, um, because, is that you've lost your foundation for movement. So um, we look at the alignment of the foot and um, really, Plantar, plantar fasciitis can occur with almost any alignment. It does tend to occur more frequently in people with pronated flat feet, but um, it can occur with almost any type of alignment. Um, we have to look at the balance and the mobility of all the little joints in the foot and the ankle area. There are actually 33 joints in the foot. And sometimes these little midfoot joints uh, get stuck and they don't move or the the joint between the calcaneus and the ankle, the subtalar joint, if that joint gets stiff, then more stress and more force goes on the plantar fascia itself. And also, and probably one of the most common reasons for developing plantar fasciitis is that the little muscles in the feet go to sleep. And that's because we put our feet into shoes every day. And though it's like, to me, it's like putting your foot in a coffin. The, the, the muscles don't have to do anything they become atrophied, they don't work, and um, then they do not support the arch. So in that original picture, when I was showing you the static structure of the plantar fascia and then all those little muscles, you have the static stabilizing um, function that the fascia provides for your arch and the dynamic stabilizing function that the muscles provide. And when those little muscles go to sleep, then the static structure, your plantar fascia has to do all the work and it can become overloaded and break down. 
So it's the ABCs, alignment, balance, and correct uh, muscles firing that we need to look at to, to figure out why the plantar fascia has broken down. And if we understand how it breaks down, then we know how to fix it. Now, clinically, when somebody comes into my office, um, the most common uh, complaint is pain and it's pain that's right at the heel, right where the plantar fascia inserts. And it's usually a little bit more towards the inside, towards the big toe side of your foot. Um, and it's exquisitely tender when you touch it. It's usually um, very difficult to step on your foot first thing in the morning. Uh, and as you get up and you get moving and, and things kind of warm up and loosen up, um, it may actually feel better. Uh, but over time, the pain will get progressively worse. So it may start out as a mild ache and you'd really ignore it. And you don't do much for it. But then over time, you notice that it's getting progressively worse. And then it gets eventually to a point where you have trouble walking and you limp and um, you have a hard time standing and, and, and walking. Uh, people who are standing uh, on hard surfaces, concrete floors, or uh, moving and playing on hard surfaces such as ten hard court tennis courts or um, uh, basketball courts, uh, people that do a lot of running on pavement uh, are particularly prone to uh, developing plantar fasciitis. And from a Physical exam standpoint, um, what we really look for is that point tenderness on the heel right in this red spot here. Um, if we find tenderness elsewhere, so it's more up on the bone on the sides of your heel, um, I think about uh, calcaneal stress fractures, or if the tenderness is more in the midfoot around the navicular or even more uh, in the forefoot, you could have a different stress fracture, either a navicular or a second metatarsal. Um, tenderness that is more around the ankle joint, up, up a little higher than the sole of your foot, uh, can be associated with a tarsal tunnel syndrome. The tendons and nerves travel right behind the medial malleolus here. And uh, similar to a carpal tunnel syndrome, where you've got the little um, roof of the tunnel, if it gets narrowed, then there's a nerve that can become compressed, and that will create pain that is more in the midfoot area and often there can be some numbness associated with this. Um, and so finally, we would also want to make sure that you don't have a back problem with a, a disc injury, with pain radiating uh, into your foot. Most of the time, uh, people can recognize that they have pain in their back and it's traveling down their leg, but occasionally the pain will skip the upper part of the leg and just focus more on the heel and the sole of the foot. And there may be numbness and tingling on the sole of the foot. You rarely have numbness and tingling on your foot if it's true plantar fasciitis. Um, one of the most important physical examination findings that I look for is tightness of the gastrocnemius muscle, and that's the muscle on the back of your calf. And you can tell if this is tight by testing your ankle range of motion. Um, when you try and pull your toes up towards your nose, so that's called dorsiflexion, if you do it with your knee bent, you'll probably have more dorsiflexion than when your knee is straight. And this is because the gastroc muscle crosses the knee. So if you find that your ankle dorsiflexion is um, worse with your knee straight than when your knee is bent, you do have some gastrocnemius tightness and that can lead to increased stress on the plantar fascia and breakdown. And that's probably besides the tenderness directly over the plantar fascia insertion, it's probably the most common finding that um, we see in the office. Um, as far as in, I, I didn't really mention investigations, you know, when you go to the doctor, we do a history, we do a physical exam, and then we do investigations to try and um, prove what our diagnosis is. Um, it's rare that you really need to have investigations for uh, plantar fasciitis. And very commonly, people will get an x-ray and they'll be diagnosed with a calcaneal spur. Um, I'll talk to you about that in a minute and show an x-ray. Uh, I'm not a big believer in dealing with the spur. I think the spur is, a, is as a result of the increased stress on the calcaneus and is not the cause of the plantar fasciitis. So we think about the four R's. That's relaxing the tissues, restoring correct mobility and strength, resetting the correct muscle and movement patterns, and then reprogramming everything. 
So when we look at the traditional treatments, uh, such as um, ultrasound or laser over the plantar fascia itself, this can be beneficial to decrease any inflammation that's associated with the partial thickness tear of the fascia. Um, it can help to restore pliability to the tissue. And really that's one of the key things in the initial stages of this problem. It's restoring pliability and elasticity to the fascia so that when you take a step onto the tissue, it doesn't just pull right off of the bone and re-injure your healing tissue. So I think that there is a role uh, for some laser uh, or ultrasound um, in your foot if, if um, you have access to it, but I don't think it's an absolute necessity. Um, also, it's critical that you would work the calf uh, so that you loosen the, the calf muscle because you wanna relieve the tension on the, the, if you visualize the rope, you wanna relieve the tension on both sides of the rope so that the area that needs to heal can, um, can heal without being overloaded. Uh, shockwave therapy, I don't really think there's much role for shockwave therapy in plantar fasciitis treatment. Um, the, the premise here is that you're going to blast away that spur and um, then allow the tissue to heal. Um, I, I, I know that the studies basically that look at shockwave therapy um, may show some benefit at around the year mark. Um, and then it's, but at 36 months out, there's really no difference in any of the treatments that are compared, such as uh, injections. And in my mind, after 36 months, probably the body just healed itself anyway. So you really can't tell whether it was the shockwave therapy or just your body's natural uh, healing capabilities. There are a number of different injections. Uh, cortisone is something uh, that can be very beneficial in decreasing inflammation in the short term. Say in the first two or three months, it'll decrease pain. Um, it is a very painful, nasty injection. Um, but I, and I caution you about having too many of these because one of the side effects is atrophy of the fat pad on your heel. And if that fat pad on your heel um, shrinks and disappears, you can end up with a worse condition than the plantar fascia. So um, I would encourage you to exhaust all of the other things that we're going to talk about in a moment before you uh, rush to have cortisone injections. Um, injections such as PRP, that's platelet-rich plasma, uh, stem cells, um, have some, I think, potential benefit for regeneration of and healing. Um, the studies aren't really... Um, uh, they're not really convincing to me. Again, at, at sort of 12 to um, 18 months out, it shows a difference between somebody who's had the PRP injection, but at 36 months, there's no difference between someone with the injection and uh, patients with a shockwave treatment or no treatment. So uh, I'm not a huge proponent of these uh, therapies, although um, the initial... Um, treatment of ultrasound modalities to improve tissue pliability, I think is a very good principle. Um, orthotics um, are something that you could possibly use temporarily um, to maintain the arch of your foot, but this is a static uh, or, or uh, yeah, a static way of regaining your arch and um, Really, I'm a huge proponent of wakening up the muscles, small muscles in your feet. And that is probably the single most important thing you can do uh, in the treatment and recovery for plantar fasciitis. And that's getting those little muscles woken up. So using an orthotic temporarily, um, it's possible, but I would far prefer that you get your muscles woke, woken up and dynamically support your arch. And you can do it pretty quickly and you can save yourself uh, a chunk of cash. Um, compression socks uh, can provide some um, comfort. Um, the, the theory behind compression is that it takes some of the pressure off of the plantar fascia, that it may help improve blood flow. Um, if you feel better when you're wearing these, go for it. Um, night splints, so you can see this is an apparatus where you, the person is trying to pull their foot up towards their, uh, their head and keep the fascia stretched. Uh, I'm not a huge proponent of this either. Um, I, I think that the, the, the idea here is to have the healing tissue um, bridged at night while you're, you know, while you're sleeping, but if you're lengthening it and creating too large a gap, then it's harder for the cells to actually hop across the, the area that needs to be repaired. 
And um, I'm a bigger, big believer in using movement to heal versus the static type of modalities. And they can be effective, but I'm a big believer in movement. So the four R's that's reestablishing your foundation for movement is the critical thing as with all of our wear and tear injuries. So we're going to do activities to relax the plantar fascia, to relax the gastrocnemius muscle. Uh, we're going to make sure that all the little joints in your foot are mobilized. Um, Eric did a, um, a YouTube live session uh, on balance, and he taught us how to mobilize the little joints in your foot and ankle area. So I would advise you to look at that. And um, I'm going to show you uh, a couple of things for um, myofascial release in a second. Um, resetting the, the muscles uh, in the foot and ankle. Um, Eric's got some great little videos, uh, weird ankle uh, exercises, uh, looking at uh, pronation, uh, correcting pronation of the foot, um, also are uh, great for resetting and restoring mobility in your foot and ankle. Um, I really like the way that Eric approaches restoring mobility in the foot and ankle. Uh, you know, you go most of the time, uh, people say, okay, you, you know, you're going to put your foot down and you're going to kind of reef on your ankle, keeping your knee straight to try and stretch that gastroc. And um, you're just sort of passively trying to do the stretch versus actively moving your body by pulling your toes towards your nose so that you're actively stretching the tissue at the back of your leg. Um, the active uh, mobility is far uh, more effective in, this, in the signals that it sends to the cells to create a lengthening response and a remodeling response versus just reefing on tissue passively uh, where you may stretch through the part of your body that you don't want to stretch. So I, um, I recommend that you look at, the, at these videos and eventually you have to reprogram and put all of these movements together and I've, I've seen some comments that people, um, you know, they say, well, the four hours, it's kind of vague in, in what my description are. And really what I'm doing is I'm in this, in this format, or we're talking about basic principles, but what you have to do, I believe is sort of put it all together. And I would highly recommend that you go to the lower limb control course where Eric takes you through step by step and teaches you how to move through the progression so that you're not constantly spinning your wheels. And he's very specific in, um, in, in what you need to do. Um, you may not have to go to the course if you're, if you're um, say you're in the earliest stages of the plantar fasciitis and you don't have a lot of tissue damage uh, by just turning on the right muscles uh, and doing um, the exercises in the individual videos from the YouTube live uh, or the, the um, videos that we have in the links, you, you could be fine. And that's great. We hope you know, that this is helpful. But if you're struggling with getting over um, the problem, I suggest you go to the lower limb control and go step by step so that you not only reestablish your foundation for movement, but then it helps you to build your endurance, strength, power, and speed. There's two sort of issues where I see people with wear and tear pain. One is that you don't have a foundation for movement and that's leading to an overload of the tissue. Um, and the second one is that you're feeling good. You know, finally your foot feels good. You've, you've been working really hard at things and now you're excited to get back to your sport and you jump back and you play a four hour tennis match instead of going out and just sort of gradually building the duration of time and the intensity of your activity. Or if you've been dying to, you know, get out there and run your, 10k race and you're finally feeling good and you go out and you train and you run 10k instead of slowly building up your uh, endurance and your strength so that your body can adapt to um, the new movement uh, patterns and the tissues can continue to strengthen over time. So uh, what did, I've had plantar fasciitis and it was really miserable. Um, and I didn't know Eric at this time. And oh my gosh, I wish I did because I think I would have gotten better a lot faster uh, because of his dissociation exercises are so much more effective than the ones that I was doing. Now, the things that I did do that, I've, um, that worked really well for me is um, first thing in the morning, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just get up and stand on my foot because I, the, the tissue at the, especially in the earliest stages, when you have a bit of inflammation, the tissue is not very pliable. 
So you put your full body weight on it. And what you do is you end up sort of tearing the regenerated tissue. That regenerated tissue takes time to mature. It takes weeks and, and you know months to actually become normal, but you'll feel much better before months. Um, but so what I would do is I would get up and I would uh, not put a lot of weight on that, my foot that was sore. I'd get over into the bathtub and I would put about two inches of water just so that my foot would be under really, really warm water, the, as, as hot as I could tolerate. And then I would do um, active um, exercises to work on stretching the fascia on the bottom of my foot. So um, if you look at the weird ankle exercises and the pronation exercises that Eric has, you can do those standing at the bathtub with the really warm water and that will help to loosen up the tissue and to fire up the little intrinsic muscles in your feet. It'll be very, very effective. Um, so you'll take uh, an extra 10 minutes in the morning to do that before you start your day. And then I would ice after activity. Um, I found icing before activity wasn't very helpful because the tissue was stiff and not pliable feeling. So the, the warmth and the heat would loosen it up, but then after activity, Icing directly over the heel where the area that gets injured can help to prevent any inflammation and get you going into the recovery regeneration mode faster. Um, and the studies and literature show that um, taping your foot. So while you're in the throes of things, uh, you want to try to protect the plantar fascia. So until the muscles have become strong enough and active enough in your foot and you've corrected your movement dysfunction, you can do this uh, dire taping method. And um, I would suggest that you just Google dire taping and there's some YouTube videos out there that will show you exactly how to do this. And that will, um, it's, an, it's a splint that will just take the pressure off of the uh, plantar fascial insertion to allow the healing um, tissue to be protected so that you don't tear it every single time you take a step. Um, you know, you can run into some problems with your skin with the tape. So, and, and it, to me, this is a temporary thing that you want to use um, just while you're getting your muscles strong enough and we can't strengthen within a day. So you're gonna use it for the first maybe four to six weeks as you're getting, uh, getting back to your activity or trying to maintain some activity. Um, if you do have trouble with your skin uh, in a reaction to the tape, you can use um, a mild hydrocortisone cream just to, um, try to prevent uh, any response. Um, also, um, rolling, foam rolling is something that's talked about with um, lengthening and um, uh, lengthening the, the plantar fascia. So after you've been in the tub and you've warmed up the tissue, what you can do is use a ball or a roller to, um, to actively lengthen this tissue. So you're not going to stand here close to the heel. You don't want to stand on the area that's trying to repair, but you're going to put the roller kind of under your mid to forefoot. And I don't want you to just stand there on it. What I want you to do is some of the exercises that Eric teaches about lifting the big toe up, keeping the other four toes down, putting the four toes down, lifting the big toe up so that you're actually getting things moving and sliding underneath the fascia, as well as help, helping this um, a plantar fascia itself to lengthen. And then you can lie down and you can use the roller to um, actively lengthen your gastroc. So you'll place the back of your leg onto the roller. And again, you don't just kind of sit there and roll back and forth, but you find a spot and then you move your ankle up and down and you wiggle your ankle side to side. So what you're doing is you're loosening up all the little fascial connections between the uh, calf muscles and the foot muscles uh, where they can be kind of stuck and not moving and gliding so well. And then really the key thing, as I've, I've mentioned already, is getting those little intrinsic muscles in the feet woken up, which you are doing by the um, uh, applying weight to your foot, making sure you've got your metatarsal pressure evenly applied, and then individually moving your toes uh, and um, an ankle and uh, following Eric's direction with these um, dissociation exercises, uh, it's really going to help you to get better quickly. Uh, it, you'll, you'll see a response within, within weeks instead of months and months and months and months or years of having pain in your heel. So um, it's a very powerful technique. 
Um, so the calcaneal spur, this x-ray here on, um, on our left is a normal x-ray. This is the calcaneus or the heel bone. It's uh, the largest bone in our, in our foot. This is the ankle bone above it, the talus. And this is a, um, a magnified view. And you can see here how there is a spur that is on the um, sole of our uh, calcaneus or the bottom of the calcaneus, right where the plantar fascia inserts. And this spur has um, developed because of tension on the plantar fascia where it's constantly pulling on the bone. And as you remember, our bone responds to a stimulus. So if you are constantly pulling on the bone, our body will make more bone. And you can even see on the, on the heel here where the Achilles tendon inserts, there's a little tiny spur. So this person has a uh, very tight fascia all along the back of their, their leg. So they're pulling too much on the Achilles tendon, they're pulling too much on the plantar fascia and they're making extra bone. The bone itself isn't the problem. The problem is the too much tension on the tissue. And that's where you have to look at, okay, why is there too much tension on the tissue? And um, oftentimes the gastroc is too tight because our glute isn't functioning properly. So you need to go, it, this is where I, I really like the lower extremity control course that Eric kind of gets you going from the foot ground up so that you're incorporating all of the principles of correcting why the back of your body is too tight. So you need to get your glute firing properly so that your gastroc isn't overworking and um, being too tight. So I just ignore these spurs. Uh, if we were to do x-rays of everybody in the world, we'd see loads and loads of these spurs and uh, they're just uh, a sign of being active and having too much tension there. But So a common question I get and, and um, a common thing that I see with people is they work so hard to get better and they get better from their plantar fasciitis. And then they stop doing their activities that they are not all their activities, but all of their sort of rehab type of stretching. And then their problem comes back. And um, I think that this is a really important uh, concept and theme that we need to really um, understand. And I hope, um, I hope that, that I can inspire you to maybe develop some new habits. Um, because we are active people, we are moving around every day, we're going to create an imbalance in our body. And unless we do something actively to rebalance our body, those imbalances just progressively get worse over time. And so you stop plantar fasciitis from coming back by recognizing that an imbalance is developing because of movement. And it's not a bad thing. It's not like you're a bad person or you're doing anything wrong. It's just that you're going out and you're doing repetitive movements and these asymmetries develop. Um, and the, and uh, really what you need to do is always be looking to maintain your foundation for movement so that you prevent any part of your body from breaking down. And this is why I am, I'm, I'm just so incredibly excited about the ROM Coach app that um, has been released this week. I think that this is going to be... Um, a revolutionary um, change uh, for people. It's going to provide an opportunity for people to easily identify where they have issues in their body. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the app, um, Eric has designed and developed this. He's worked really hard on it uh, and it's just come out this week. And what you do is that you download the app, you go through a movement assessment and you get a pass or a fail. And um, you have to be a little careful when it comes to the pass or fail, um, because I know I'm a really competitive person. <laughs> when I first took this, I was like, oh, God, I want to pass this. And really, you need the attitude of, OK, it's not pass or fail, good or bad. It's just a mechanism of identifying where you may have an issue. And so there's several movements that you will go through, and you may identify a number of areas where you have uh, a lack of mobility, or you may not be able to do the move because you don't have enough strength. And then there's an algorithm that Eric has developed, which will then assign you some specific exercises that you can do to address this uh, mobility or strength issue. 
And um, what I think uh, is very powerful about the app is that you can then schedule your exercises, which may be you know, five minutes of exercise, uh, two or three times a week. You can schedule it in and get a reminder and address the imbalances before they become pathologies. Um, so I'm really excited. I'm, I'm, um, I, I think this is going to be fantastic. And what I, when I'm seeing patients in the clinic now, if they come in and they've got, uh, say, a, a plantar fasciitis, then I would recommend as the primary um, program to deal with the plantar fasciitis as lower limb control. But then I would encourage people to go and do the movement assessment so that you can see if you have any other issues, because most of us do. I've got to tell you, I've had every single one of them. And with all of the knowledge that I have and everything that I know about the body, I've had every one of them and I've had to deal with them over time. And I think part of my um, desire to really help people at this stage is to get them to fix it before it's broken. Because if you can prevent your plantar fasciitis from developing or coming back in the first place, you save yourself days, months, weeks, years sometimes of pain. Um, and there's just one caveat with the movement assessment. Um, people who have hypermobility, you've got to know yourself. Um, you could, because you can kind of cheat and do some of these movements. Like there's one where you have to reach your, your hands behind your back and touch your hands. And, um, I can't do that one actually. <laughs> so I've got work to do, but if you're hypermobile, you may be able to move through your spine more than uh, I can, for example. And so you're not biomechanically achieving what you should be achieving with your shoulders. And so I encourage you to take the assessment, but make sure that you're aware of where your body is lined up and what the goal of, the, of that um, movement is in the assessment. And if you're not sure, email us and ask us um, because it's better to um, sort of not pass the test and then go through the exercises to reprogram and gain the strength in the part of your body that you need it, because we don't want you moving through the part that you shouldn't be moving through when you're hypermobile. Uh, but I'm, I'm so excited about uh, the app and um, really looking forward to working with Yusuf and, and Eric to, um, to develop it in, in the future. And, and we're really excited to hear from you guys about what you might need. And particularly, I'm interested in hearing from a pain perspective where you think that the, the ROM coach can go and what we can provide for you um, in the future. So um, that's all I have to say from um, a presentation, a formal presentation. And now would uh, love to hear what you have to say in the chat. If you have any questions, um, please uh, let us know. Okay, that was a great presentation, Doc. Really enjoyed that. Oh, thanks, Yusuf. We've uh, we've actually been been getting questions as as you've been going along, and I have a few of them here lined up for you. So the first one is from Estvan. Um, can I still play tennis while trying to recover from plantar fasciitis? Well, um, hi, hi there, uh, Susanna. <laughs> How are you? Um, Susanna is a really um, a great tennis player and um, she actually has suffered from plantar fasciitis. And the short answer is yes. Uh, you have to be careful. Like if you can't walk, then you really shouldn't be running. But if you're able to prepare your body to go out and play, because often you'll feel really bad when you first get up in the morning and you first get moving, but as you get the tissue more pliable, and if you do what I suggested about heating up the tissue, activating the right muscles, making sure you've got, uh, the pliability of your gastroc and your um, plantar fascia. And then you may need to tape the, tape the sole of your foot for the first few weeks while you're regaining strength. Then yes, you can go and play because once you get warmed up, you actually feel better. Um, and then you need to gauge how long you're out on the court or how intensely you're playing. So if you're, if you're able to stand and you're able to walk and kind of run lightly, then you're going to have a light hit on the tennis court, maybe do some drills where you stand in a corner and your opponent, you can run them all over the place um, versus playing a full out match. Um, but then you can, as your plantar fascia heals and the pain diminishes and your strength is improving and your mobility is improving, you won't need to take your foot anymore and you'll be able to increase the intensity and the duration of uh, your play. So 
play, but use common sense. All right. Uh, next up is Ben, and it's a quick one. Um, how do you stop plantar fasciitis from coming back? Hi, Ben. Um, okay, so really what you need to do is to maintain your foundation for movement. So if you understand why you got the plantar fasciitis in the first place, so is your calf muscle too tight? Are the intrinsic muscles in your feet asleep? Um, you, you would address those issues by, if you're um, activating your glutes, by wakening up the intrinsic muscles in your feet. So it's basically by restoring your foundation for movement and um, uh, making sure that you maintain that foundation. So if you go and you play tennis or you go and you play basketball, soccer, whatever it is, you jog, you're going to create, recreate imbalance. So after you've finished, or at least for sure before you start, the next time you're gonna be active, reestablish your foundation for movement. Make sure the tissue's pliable, turn everything on, meaning all the right muscles, and then go for it. Okay, uh, next up we have Mitch, uh, 30 years old. How can I keep my feet healthy when I work 12 hour shifts in boots walking on concrete floor? Uh, I've had custom orthotics for years to treat plantar fasciitis, but nothing has improved. Been walking around um, on concrete for 12 years. Most pain is in the heel. By the end of the day, it's constant ache. The sole of my foot sometimes locks up when my foot is extended downward. So uh, Mitch, this is a, it's a tough situation because you know, you're, it's, you're, you're really hard on your feet and you're putting your foot into a protective boot, which is encouraging all the issues that create the pain. And um, what I'm wondering is if you get any breaks and if you get some breaks throughout your day, then what you can do is take off the boot and do the exercises, uh, the weird ankle mobility exercises. Um, and you get your foot moving, you waken up the, you waken up the muscles in your feet. You could even do a little bit of active uh, foam rolling. You could have a, a tennis a lacrosse ball in your pocket, pop it out, having a coffee, sit and roll your foot, turn on the little muscles in your feet. Um, do some of the Eric exercises. You could really do them anywhere, anytime. And I know it's hard when you work 12 hours and you're tired at the very end of the day, it's probably the last thing you want to do. So if you can kind of schedule it into a coffee break or lunchtime, uh, it'll make a huge difference for you. Uh, it'll take, it'll take uh, several weeks to sort of build up the strength in those muscles. But once you get the muscles in your feet turned on and stronger, um, you'll, you'll feel a big difference. That's a good question. Thank you. Thanks for that, Doc. Uh, next up is from 72-year-old, 70, um, I don't know how to say the name. We'll just say 1426. That's part of the name there. I massage my feet every day and do incline board foot stretches. Seems to keep it at bay. Do I need to do more? Don't want it coming back. So um, the stretches will help with maintaining your pliability. Um, what I would really encourage you to do is to turn on those little muscles in your feet. So check out the uh, videos that show how to activate the little muscles in your feet and mobilize the, the small joints in your feet. Um, you can incorporate um, Eric's mobilization from the Balance uh, YouTube Live uh, video uh, into your massage um, and take the lower extremity course because this will give you a whole bunch of things you can do to prevent the problem from coming back. Okay, and for Keep the- Keep active at 72, I love it. Uh, for the people listening as well, I, I've included links to anything that uh, Dr. B has mentioned. So for lower limb control, for the app, and for the um, video that Eric had done that she mentioned, all of those are included in the comments section. Uh, next up is Teresa. Uh, my PF has taken over my whole foot. I have stiffness, light pain in the areas right behind my ankles and also in the front of the ankle. I'm 56. So more of a comment, I'm not really seeing a question, but do you have any recommendations for Teresa? Well, Teresa, I think you've got to get the foundation for movement going. It's kind of a, I know it's a repetitive answer, but it's, it's, um, it'll make a big difference. Um, so I would, I would check out the lower extremity control course and that'll be the most comprehensive uh, approach for you. It'll teach you how to mobilize. And I think that when you've got a had a really stiff joint for a long period of time and, um, 
a condition is sort of taken over, you're going to have some discomfort potentially while you're doing these mobilizations and you need to go very gently um, and you'll feel discomfort while you're doing um, it, like it shouldn't be killing you. It may be a little bit uncomfortable, but you'll start to feel better after you do it. So um, be patient, go slowly. Uh, and Eric gives some really great guidelines as to what you need to do to progress next. And he'll, he'll um, take you through uh, what you need to do. So I, I would, I would, encourage you to try the lower extremity control course. All right. Uh, next up, it's from Team Riggs, a uh, 50-year-old male. What might be causing pain in the ball of my foot? Uh, padded shoes, no pain, but bare feet. It's very painful. Uh, very fit and active, weight training, heavy sports since teens. Always had strong, stable feet from Taekwondo. But the last six months, he's had constant pain tried ibuprofen and ice uh, icing and rolling okay um well a couple of things come to mind um, i'm wondering if you can let me know if it's more closer to the big toe or the baby toe um but there are several several conditions um one can be what we call metatarsalgia and that's the metatarsals are the bones that are in the forefoot and sometimes they get stuck so if you go to um, Eric's uh, Balance Live YouTube, he'll show you how you can mobilize them. And if my hand, it, so my, fin my toe, my, say my fingers are representing my toes, the metatarsals would be like the bones that are in my hand. And what you want to actually do is you grab each of the individual bones and you move them up and down. And most of the time I find that people um, get those metatarsals get stuck. So by mobilizing the metatarsal, you'll be able to take the pressure off of the ball of your foot. Uh, it's, there's a potential that you could be squeezing one of the little nerves that's between the metatarsal heads, like similarly in the hand. So it could be sort of uh, a nerve between the two bones. But again, if you, get the, if you get the bones wiggling and moving, then the nerve can breathe. Uh, and finally, uh, it could be a stress fracture in your foot. Um, if you have specific point tenderness that's directly on the bone, I would be a little bit more concerned about a stress fracture and I would go get a plain x-ray with your family doctor to rule that out. Um, but uh, it sounds to me like one of the, the uh, metatarsals isn't moving properly. And then what you need to do is go through the ankle mobility uh, and foot mobility exercises to turn the muscles on so that they can maintain the mobility of the metatarsal. Right. Great question. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jason D. Um, how much does being overweight play into plantar fasciitis? Uh, also mentioned, I have over pronation and wear orthotics that help quite a bit with that. Well, weight will play a role. Uh, two and a half times your body weight goes through your foot with every step. So if you have more weight, then it's going to put more stress on your fascia. However, having said that, um, I think the key is getting your muscles strong. I, I don't, I'm not a big person to focus on the weight. What I like to say is you got to make sure your muscles are strong enough to tolerate the load. So um, I would encourage you to strengthen the muscles in your feet so that they can be strong enough to support the weight of your body. And I think that the other thing that happens is you start exercising, being more active, um, your body remodels, that your engine goes from a two-cylinder engine to a six-cylinder engine because you've got more muscle. And so then you don't have to focus so much on um, your weight necessarily, but of course you want to have a good diet, eat well. Um, so strengthen the muscles in your feet. That'll be the key for you. Okay. Next up, uh, Chris Tan. It's a bit of a long, long one with a with a good comment here. So I'll start with her comment. Okay. Um, that's unrelated to the question, but Doctor B, you just called me out on the ROM coach assessment. Um, oh. I can cheat that <laughs> movement, but decided to opt out of it, performing uh, that hands touching one. So <laughs> I guess you've called out people that are trying to beat the assessment versus really, uh, get the movements in. Uh, her question was. Um, or his, I'm 33, I have aches in my feet, especially the right foot when I take my first step in the morning, but it's not in my heel, it's midfoot closer to the ball, more spread out from bottom to top. 
Um, additional notes. Uh, this person has EDS. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you do, Doc. Um, airless Danlos syndrome. So that's okay. hypermobility. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my ankles are very hypermobile, but I've done a lot of stability work to control them. Used to have inner knee pain, but it's better. My arches feel more present than in years. Uh, foot aches didn't start until quarantine in March when I stopped getting massages. I do have tight calves. I tried OTC orthotics and they hurt. I have LBP, had disc uh, protrusions, uh, L4 to 6 last year. And geneticists told me I have uh, piezogenic papules common with EDS, but I can't see them. I'm active, had, have good physiotherapy, stand barefoot a lot. Can't tell if I have PLF. So lots to digest in there. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go to the nuts and the bolts. Um, so the bottom line is um, that you have got, you know, you have hypermobility, that you're, you're, uh, all of your joints are hypermobile. And one thing that I've noticed uh, over the years is that there's an interesting association between back pain and plantar fasciitis. Um, and and um, you really want to focus a lot on your back because the nerves that supply your feet, if those nerve roots are irritated, it makes you more susceptible to feeling the discomfort of your plantar fascia. And I think that your plantar fasciitis may not necessarily be like a, a traction one where you're, um, you're pulling on it, but more of a problem that you're collapsing onto your fascia, which isn't able to... Um, have the tension in it to actually support your arch. And the, the bottom line is, is that you have to work as hard as you can. And it sounds like you're doing an amazing job um, at getting stronger intrinsic muscles uh, in your feet. I, um, I would recommend, these are the ugliest shoes ever, but I love them. They're Vibrams, uh, the five finger toe shoes, that you, the, the five, you, you put all of your toes individually into the shoes. I actually saw Eric wearing them last, uh, was it, I think it was last week when he was demonstrating how to saw the, how to saw the piece of wood. And I said, rock on, he's got them. I wear them when I walk my dog. Um, and I think they're amazing for helping you to, um, you have a little bit of support from the shoe, but it keeps the mobility of all the little joints and allows you to keep the intrinsics functioning while you're walking. So don't, you have to work your way into these things, um, but they can be a very powerful tool. So keep up all the good work. All right, I just posted the, uh, a link to those specific shoes you were talking about. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, you're awesome, Yusuf, I appreciate that. <laughs> trying to keep up with you. <laughs> all right, um, from Steve, I'm 56, have some fi minor plantar issues. Recently running for two months, but I've had pain on the back of heel after running, which has made me stop running. Any suggestions for this pain? Thanks. So I think that it's important that um, the back of the heel, I'm not sure if that's more the Achilles tendon or back, you mean, you know, the back and bottom, but regardless of what it is, you want to make sure that your gastroc and your plantar fascia are pliable before you go out for your run. So um, similar to what um, I discussed with Susanna going and playing tennis, I'd like you to warm up the tissue to um, roll both your foot, your gastroc to make sure that they're uh, loose so that you're loosening the ends of the rope to take the pressure off of the area that is painful and being overloaded. Then you activate all the little intrinsic muscles. So you'll do your little foot exercises to turn them on and turn your glutes on, then go for a run but don't go and run like, uh, like a crazy man. <laughs> go for a walk jog possibly where you may go and jog lightly for, uh, depending on how fit you are and how good you feel, uh, you want to stop before you get pain, then walk a bit, then jog a bit. And don't go for too far the very first day or two. Just you know, go, go maybe in circles also so that if you start to notice discomfort that you can be at home and you're not like 10 miles out and have to get home and, and then you're, you're basically, it's like picking a scab if you go too hard, too fast, and you have to start all over again. So try to gauge how much you can do without becoming too sore. A little bit of discomfort is not the end of the world. But so, and so long as you're getting better day by day, I'm happy. 
If you go and you do a workout and you're a little bit sore, if you feel great the next day, you can carry on. If you're feeling stiff and sore and it's worse, you need to back off on your running and, um, and your activity so that you can give yourself a chance to recover. So you may have to go every other day. Uh, you may have to substitute and go uh, and do some water running and do some other cro cross training so that you allow the tissue to heal. Uh, but I would play around with those uh, suggestions. Great. Uh, another one related to running here. Uh, my right knee hurts when I walk, but when I run, I'm perfectly okay. What can I do? <laughs> um, I would run everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a little hard to say, you know, depends on where it hurt, where your knee hurts. Um, is it at the front, the back, the side? Um, it's probably that something's getting tight and stiff that when you're running, the tissues all loosen up so that the, the imbalance isn't as great. Um, but then when you stop running, something is getting tight. And so whatever that is, it could be the IT band, it could be your quad, uh, it could be a combination of things. Um, so I would suggest you do the ROM coach assessment and see where you fall in you know, the deep squat ability. There's a, several of the assessments that are going to look at how your mechanics are for your lower extremity. And that will provide you with some exercises that you can do that will prevent that tissue from getting too tight because you'll start using the right muscles. Okay, uh, so Team Riggs seems that person has brought his wife on to ask a question. Oh, thank um, you, Team Riggs. That's for, a team, it really is a team. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, four years of posterior leg pain, almost like cramping when laid on her back, wakes her in, uh, at night. Uh, then upon waking, makes calves and especially Achilles heels feel chronically tight. Has weak glute, med, and min, and SI area pain. She's 50, uh, has also had two kids at 39 and 40. Okay. I, I was going to say, this sounds like a back issue to me as, it, as you started talking. Um, and so I think that you need to look at the YouTube live that Eric did a couple of weeks ago. You can review, we did some, um, the last couple of weeks we've done on Ask Dr. B, we've discussed back issues and uh, Eric did a great YouTube live. Um, like I think it's the four or five essential exercises if you have back pain. And um, if you feel better doing that, I would highly recommend going into spine control because it's, it's an amazingly comprehensive program. And it's something that you should nip in the bud now. You're young and um, you know, it's frustrating when you get these pains, but the beauty is, is that um, if, you do, if you put the work into the, um, the exercises and into your body, uh, you'll get better. So um, good luck with that. All right, and the last one here is from Kat. Um, I had asked her to just clarify on some acronyms. So if you need these clarified, just let me know. Okay. I grew up walking barefoot and continue to walk barefoot and still having it. Um, I know what started this round of uh, PF. I'm S slash P O A T S. And I've been on crutches for seven weeks. Um, I'm interested in new remedies to help with PF. So I need the, I need this. I know what PF, PF is plantar fasciitis. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, osteochondral autograph transfer system of the medial femoral condyle microfracture uh, of the left knee. Okay. I know what that is. Um, okay. So that's, that's um, basically um, Kat's got a problem um, with her knee, which is changing the way she's loading her foot. Uh, or, you know, you don't, it's hard to know sometimes whether what came first, the chicken or the egg, but I would imagine uh, that at this point, she may do, maybe doesn't want to load that medial femoral condyle. That's the inside part of the knee. So oftentimes what happens is people start to load too much on the outside of the foot. And then that changes the whole mechanics of the foot. And um, I wonder if you still have pain in your knee. Um, I wonder how, you know, about the mobility in your knee. And I would be trying to address those issues as best that I um, can. Um, I, would, I would recommend going into the lower extremity control course because that will help you to um, deal with the mobility issues in your feet, make sure that your foot is 
sitting on the ground solid. And if you find that as you start to improve the mechanics in your foot, that your knee becomes more painful, then it's likely that you still have some imbalances around your, your, um, your knee. And I, I know that the procedure that you've had is to um, surgically, it will address a loss of articular cartilage on a part of the joint, but we need to always go back and ask ourselves, why did you end up with that problem in the first place? Why were you overloading that part of your knee? So we need to help you with your hips and your foot and ankle uh, by Im improve the mobility, the strength and the stability of those two joints to take the pressure off your knee. Um, so it's a little difficult to know with just the information I have, whether or not it's the hip or the foot and ankle that are creating the knee issue. Um, but I would encourage you to address both. Okay, uh, that's it for questions from the channel. Um, you're getting a lot of thank yous, by the way, from everybody that uh, oh, you've wonderful. helped here and others, others that are listening. And then Kat just said she's uh, never thought about the Vibram, so she's going to try um, try those out. Excellent. I think she'll really enjoy them. They're actually, they're a great shoe. Um, uh, interesting. They're an interesting shoe. I really, I, I recommend them. And they really help with people with knee problems. Um, it was fantastic. But well, Yusuf, I think it's one o'clock. Um, so if there aren't any other questions coming in, um, we could we could wrap it up. So we can uh, we can wrap it up. We have those three other questions that you had mentioned uh, earlier. Oh, if right. you want to address one of them. Well, why don't we? I um, have time. If you have time, I have time. Yeah, we can do um, a few more minutes. I think uh, people are still enjoying um, your uh, your yeah. info here so we can give them yeah. a little bit more info actually i have a question from me just from listening about okay. the, the vibrams i've seen recently some new companies that are making it even less and there's like these stick on almost like stickers that you can put at the bottom of your foot so that you're not oh. technically barefoot but they're thick enough to protect your foot Interesting. Um, would you recommend that going even further than the vibrams like wearing even less um I think it depends on the strength of your foot. So I guess it's possible, yes, that you could go even less. Um, I know for myself and the way my foot is, I probably wouldn't be comfortable with that because I didn't have enough strength and mobility. But as I've gotten stronger in doing um, Eric's exercises and wearing my Vibrams, um, uh, I, like I've just noticed such a, a big improvement. So I think it comes down to comfort level and what feels good for you, um, you know, there's some people that are very uncomfortable walking in bare feet and there's others that love it. So uh, I, I think it becomes a personal choice there. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so one of the questions that came in through the forms is from Keshin, mm -hmm. who's a football player. I sprained my ankle over four months ago, rehabbed it for quite a bit, but still there's pain when I run. What can I do to get rid of the pain? I sprained my left ankle uh, months ago, it still hurts when I step with my foot turned to the left and it still has some swelling. I stretched my ankle using a band and I pretty much have been doing that daily since it happened. It was getting better at a constant rate until the second month when it plateaued. It felt, um, it felt the same since. Okay, um, Kishana, I think there's, a, there's two things that come to my mind. Um, after you sprain your ankle, so when you sprain your ankle, you're tearing a, one of the ligaments. And when we think about the stability of uh, the ankle joint, there's static stabilizers, which are the ligaments, the shape of the bone, the capsule. So you've lost one of your static stabilizers. So now you have to rely more on the dynamic stabilizers and that's the muscles and your proprioception. So I encourage you not only to stretch, but you need to start to activate and turn muscles on in your foot, your ankle, and your all the way up to your, your hip. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, so you could look at um, Eric's weird ankle exercises, um, the, all the foot and ankle exercises for the um, overpronated uh, or pronated uh, flat foot. Those will help you out. I'm always a little concerned if someone sprained their ankle and they're having swelling that is inside the joint or around the joint uh, at four months. And if you haven't had an x-ray uh, for your ankle, I think you should have one. Um, and if the swelling, and it's specifically in the ankle, not necessarily from the ligament, but if it's in the joint itself, you should have an MRI. And the reason that this is, is that 
When you sprain your ankle, you can knock off a little bit of the articular cartilage and bone. This is called an osteochondral fragment, or you can damage the bone underneath the cartilage. And um, this can cause ongoing pain, particularly on the outside of the ankle. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you don't have an osteochondral injury in addition to the ankle sprain, because if you have that injury, you may need to modify your weight bearing activities to allow that part of the bone to heal. Uh, so that you don't end up with future problems. So regardless if you have the osteochondral injury, I want you to start to work on dynamic stability, um, but go get an x-ray as a minimum uh, to rule out this osteochondral uh, fracture. Great, and we've got one last one that just came in from uh, the live comments uh, from okay. Celeste. Uh, I had Celeste. PF, it's remedied, I think. I get pain when running in the in my same calf, then I walk, then I run for about half a mile, and then it goes on like that for about two miles, then no more pain. What can I do? Okay, uh, Celeste, so I would be wondering why you're overusing your gastroc. Uh, so that probably has to do with how your glutes and your core are functioning. So you want to have a look at whether you're activating your glute, whether you're, you've, you've got them working properly. So that's what I would, um, I would ask you to do. Get the glute stronger so that the gastroc isn't doing double time. All right. That's it. Okay. That's all the all questions. Right. Well, that's awesome. Well, Yusuf, thanks again for your help. It's always wonderful to have you here. And, um, and everyone, thank you for listening. We're great questions today. Um, and, uh, Love to, love to hear from you. Would love to hear what you want to hear about. Um, I love to teach. And um, we're really excited that you joined us today. So thank you so much. And bye for now.